this seminar by Professor Priscilla Wald. Um, just briefly to tell you who I am, my name is Steve Sturdy, I'm Deputy Director of the ESRC Genomics Policy and Research Forum, uh, which is probably best described as a knowledge exchange organisation based here in uh, the University of Edinburgh. And our role is to work, well, we're funded by ESRC, to work with social scientists who are studying the new life sciences. Now we interpret the various terms in that really quite broadly. Social scientists, we include people from the humanities, people from ethics, and so on. Uh, and the life sciences, likewise, we uh, interpret really quite broadly to include uh, everything through from medicine through to agriculture and so on. Uh, but particularly looking at uh, the social dimensions of scientific research and scientific work. Um, we have a broad remit, and we also have a, a, a fairly uh, generous freedom to, to uh, particularly to bring over people that we, uh, we want to work with, and it's in, in that respect that we've been uh, able to bring over Priscilla Wall. We're absolutely delighted to have her with us <coughs> as a visiting fellow in the forum for uh, that's about three weeks, in fact. So uh, we're doing a number of activities with Priscilla. Now, Priscilla, I'm sure you all know, is a professor of English at Duke University in North Carolina. Uh, and her work particularly focuses on the way in which information and narratives relating especially to issues in the life sciences, or particularly at the moment, uh, issues in the life sciences circulate in various uh, areas of both popular and scientific and legal and policy culture and inform the way in which policy gets done. So, I mean, this is a, a, a fantastically uh, valuable demonstration, I think, of the ways in which insights from the humanities can really un inform the way that we understand issues in policy. And it's really for, for that reason that we've got Priscilla over here. She's stu studying currently um, working uh, uh, on the, the genetic and genomic uh, science and the way in which uh, narratives about uh, genomics, about evolution, about genetics and descent circulate uh, in popular and other cultures. Uh, but she's also very well known, and let me hold up uh, uh, book in case you haven't seen it, for earlier work on um, narratives of disease outbreaks, contagious diseases. And this is a fantastic book, I really do recommend it. Contagious Cultures, Carriers and the Outbreak Narrative. It's a really marvellous piece of work. Um, that's what she'll be talking about today. We also thought that it would be valuable to link in because of this link, the, the, the connection, the way that Priscilla's work does demonstrate the, the value of insights from the humanities and particularly from, uh, from English literature and perspectives from, uh, from English to link up with the Medical Humanities Research Network which has recently been established here in uh, the University of Edinburgh and is uh, building up momentum under the, uh, the, uh, the convenership of Claire McEchney uh, who's sitting down here. Um, if you want more information about either the Genomics Forum or the Medical Humanities Research Network, uh, there's literature down here. Do help yourselves uh, on your way out afterwards. Um, I'm going to sit down in a moment and hand over to, uh, to Priscilla. The discussion and questions afterwards will be handled by Claire, so she'll get, you'll get a chance to have a good look at her as well and see who she is. Um, but I think probably the, uh, for now I'm going to sit down, I think I'm going to turn the lights off, and I'm going to hand you over. <laughs> To Priscilla. Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope you don't mind the lights staying off because I've got a couple of film clips and things like that. So if you you know run out of oxygen, just stand up and do a couple of jumping jacks. Um, so I'm going to start with a clip um, that was a trailer from a film that that came out in the U.S. in September and was a blockbuster hit for reasons I I will be addressing though semi can't understand. Um, it's a very, very predictable film. It was called Contagion. I don't know how many of you might have seen it. Um, and uh, the CDC was so... Sure. 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 
behind every way you can. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, and each other. Matt! No, 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 go up to your room, buddy. So we have learned no treatment protocol and no vaccine this time. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. Did you make a history of seizure? No, no, no. As of last night, there were 32 cases. Unfortunately, she did die. So much. Your wife is dead. What are you talking about? What happened to her? What happened to her? Is there any way someone can weaponize the bird flu? Is that what we're looking at? Someone doesn't have to weaponize the bird flu. The birds are doing that. Watch this. It's transmission. So we just need to know which direction. On day one, there were two people, and then four, and then sixteen. In three months, it's a billion. That's where we're headed. They're calling out the National Guard. They're moving the president underground. People will tell me. People will tip over. The truth is being kept from the world. Cook your samples, destroy everything. Hello. I need you to get me the names of everyone who serves this room. This emergency. You can't panic now. I know. I'm gonna get you all. I got people too, Dr. Cheever. We all do. Don't talk to anyone. Don't touch anyone. Stay away from other people. The band in the back. We're not sick! This is becoming a stop faster than we're figuring it out. It's mutated. So, um, I showed you that lengthy clip. You've now seen the film, by the way. There's nothing <laughs> in the same, but that's it. Um, because it is what I call a classic outbreak narrative. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. What, kind of what kinds of stories are we telling about disease emergence and at the expense of what other kinds of stories we might be telling? And how does that correspond to the way um, we deal with those issues and to the policy um, decisions that are made around them? Um, and I, I found this film particularly important because of how positive the CDC in the United States was about the Centers for um, Disease Control, et cetera, long title, um, how positive they were about it. And they put links to favorable reviews, they put links to descriptions of the film, and I was really surprised because of the inaccuracies in this film that they were touting this film so much. So I want to begin with the question of what makes this story so appealing? And I think one of the things, and you saw it happen here, is this kind of film manages and redirects our more nebulous anxieties about globalization. So Gwyneth Paltrow in the film, and you've seen all of Gwyneth Paltrow, she dies really early, so that's it. Um, but Gwyneth Paltrow is a, is a powerful corporate executive, and she's sent to um, someplace in Asia, we, I don't think we ever find out exactly where, but some exotic locale, and she brings back some horrible disease to her family. Along the way, she has a very quick affair with an old boyfriend, which has nothing to do with her illness, but I think it further criminalizes Gwyneth Paltrow. What is she doing globetrotting? And what are people bringing back to their families? So it's really about the way that globalization is really interfering with our basic social structures, our families, and so forth. And those are anxieties we really can't focus. We don't know what to do with those anxieties. So I think they're deflected onto a major pandemic, which is of course a lot more frightening, but also can be contained and managed. We can get a happy ending or some kind of closure at the end. And again, that's I'm going to be outlining the conventions of the outbreak narrative, talking about the story it does tell and the story it doesn't. Contagion itself is, I think, a very interesting concept um, and works to both configure very intimate relationships and make those intimate relationships also seem dangerous. We're constantly in contact not only with our loved ones who might infect us, but also with strangers with whom we share intimacies we're not even aware of, and they might affect us as well. So this is the opening passage from a, a recent, fairly recent book called The Politics of Global Health Governance, United by Contagion. Opening sentence. 
Health is the ultimate unifying issue for humankind. The world is becoming an ever smaller place, and microbes that cause devastating diseases do not stop for border guards. So we are united by contagion in several ways. We're united because we're all human and therefore all susceptible. But we're also united by contagion because germs can cross borders that many of us cannot. Germs don't respect borders. That's one of the conventions of the outbreak narrative or of disease emergence generally. Um, and I see as um, sort of a theoretical underpinning, and I want to just very quickly um, introduce Georg Zimmel, who was a turn of the century German sociologist. And he wrote an essay called The Stranger and defined the concept of estrangement in a very interesting and I think useful way for understanding this problem. What Zimmel said was that, you know, you usually think that um, a stranger is dangerous and uncanny because of how different you both are. But in fact, he said, it's really when you begin to see your similarities that the stranger becomes dangerous. So I might think of my identity and have a strong ontological investment in a particular group. Let's take a big group, American. I may think, you know, I have something in common with other Americans, and I am who I am fundamentally, ontologically, because I am an American. And I'm very different from a Scottish person. And then I meet a Scottish person and I realize, wow, a lot of these values that I thought made me American, in fact, we share. So what does that mean? And you know, you can get smaller, you can talk about your family, you can get larger, you can talk about religion, right? Christians, Muslims, etc. It's when you begin to realize that you have something in common with that person, it pierces that fundamental ontological investment that you have in this group. So you can do one of two things. You can expand the group and say, well, actually, maybe I share something in common with all of humanity. Maybe I want to widen my circle of how I identify myself. Or you can do the opposite, and this is where it gets dangerous. You can say, I want to make this person more of a stranger than he or she is. I'm going to demonize that person. I may even exclude them from humanity, right? And so this is the kind of tension, he says, that gets produced by the experience of estrangement, which is when you recognize what you have in common with somebody. And in case you don't know, I'm emphasizing it, I put it in red. I think that contagion is the material expression of this kind of estrangement. Contagion can make you see your common humanity. It can also make you demonize someone who's different from you who may be infecting you. This is the rest of that opening paragraph. More and more, we are coming to understand that people with diseases located anywhere from down the street to the other side of the globe have important and varied impacts on our well-being. Health has become more than a medical issue. It is also a development issue, a commercial issue, a humanitarian issue, and a security issue. And that last clause is what I'll be talking about in the rest of this talk. I have two points of origin for the story that I'm telling. One of them is the Declaration of Alma Ata. How many of you have heard of this, Declaration of Alma Ata? So this was a very important conference that was organized in September 1978 by the World Health Organization and UNICEF. And it involved delegates from 134 nations and more than 50 NGOs. And they all came together around the issue of global health. And the idea was that, um, so there, there were several, uh, several things that motivated this. The countries that uh, had programs that inspired this tended to be in the global south, so China, Tanzania, Sudan, and Venezuela, and they were very politically charged, the barefoot doctors in China. The effort, and this was part of China's move to communism, the effort to reach out to people in rural China and have doctors go into people's local communities, people who had access only to, say, tertiary health care, and say, okay, we want you to partner with us and develop programs in your own community that define health in the way that is meaningful to you. And we're going to train people in your own community to be medical practitioners. And we are going to extend health care to absolutely everybody, universal access to health care. And the UN thought this was a great idea. And it fit with their definition in um, their uh, Declaration of Human Rights with health as one of the most basic human rights. This conference affirmed that definition 
The Declaration affirmed that definition. It was a bit watered down because of politics. The US and Western Europe were a little uneasy with the politics behind this. But nonetheless, all of these signatories <coughs> signed on to commit to having universal access to health care by the year 2000. Well, we didn't make it, and I'm from a country that is not helping the, the matter. Um, but the conference, the, the, uh, the inc more inclusive definition of health that they reaffirmed was health which is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmary, infirmity, is a fundamental human right, and that the attainment of the highest possible level of health is a most important worldwide social goal whose realization requires the action of many other social and economic sectors in addition to the health sector. So note, health has a much broader definition than simply medicine. Right? Socioeconomic, geopolitical. And that makes it dovetail in interesting ways with a very different event, which was a 1989 conference in Washington, D.C. that defined the term emerging infections and disease emergence and put the terms of the outbreak narrative, as I will be showing, into circulation. And this conference came out, came after came at the end of a decade in which HIV had made itself quite well known around the globe, puncturing the sanguinity of the 1970s in the US and Western Europe, where with the um, uh, eradication of naturally occurring smallpox and other medical victories, doctors were declaring victory over infectious disease. They were saying this is just going to be a chronic problem, at least in the West. This was not going to be you know, ever a huge um, threatening problem ever again. And of course, while they were saying this, hemorrhagic fevers, new ones like Ebola, Marburg, Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, etc., were popping up, all hantavirus were popping up all over the globe, but in remote so-called locations where they weren't coming to the attention of these particular doctors. Well, HIV and scientific re medical science researchers, HIV punctured that sanguinity. And the doctors and researchers and one historian um, who got together at this conference said, okay, what do all these things have in common? Obviously, HIV is very different from Ebola. Obviously, these things have different environments and different sources and whatever. What do they all have in common? They are all new. They are all emerging infections. They are all um, infections that are, uh, that for which human beings are immunologically naive. And they all, supposedly, are coming from developing areas. And what they said is, we have to get the message out that these are not just the problems of medical science. These are also problems that are political, environmental, and economic. They involve development. They, um, development is accelerating at such a pace that human beings are put in, being put into contact with microbes they haven't encountered before, and this is what's happening. And so we need to change the entire way people are thinking about development and the way they're thinking about these diseases. Um, and what I'm going to show uh, is that, and so you see where it dovetails, even though the politics are very different from the Declaration of Alma Ata, it's a new way of thinking about health. It actually goes back to the 19th century, but people had forgotten that they had that more encompassing um, definition. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the way this conference put a certain visual and textual vocabulary into circulation. Not that these were new images, but they became sort of the uh, popular culture and the mainstream media were saturated with them. And what I studied is how uh, images, visual and, ver and uh, textual vocabulary emerges from these scientific conferences or journal articles or something, moves into the mainstream media where it proliferates and is amplified and into popular fiction where it becomes sort of dramatized and it begins to shape a conventional way of thinking about the problem, in this case disease emergence. What I will be showing is how that process happened and the consequences of that process, which is that the very vocabulary that went into circulation undercut the message that the uh, 1989 conference was trying to send. 
So um, Margaret Chen, who's the head of the World Health Organization, in September of 2008, on the 30th anniversary of Alma Mater, issued a very powerful statement called Return to Alma Mater, uh, Alma Ata, sorry, <laughs> which I always do that, which was echoed in the WHO's World Health Report of October in that year, primary health care, which is what, again, in the communities, that was called Now More Than Ever. And what she asked is, you know, these goals that people expressed in Alma Ata, Alma Ata, right, were not just idealistic, they were actually realizable and even practical. And there are economists like Amartya Sen who have been saying, you know, we really need to think about addressing the issues of global poverty and the thing that makes um, uh, diseases so rampant, so much more rampant than they would otherwise be if we had healthier populations. Specifically, when we're talking about pan, uh, pandemics, there's nothing that's a better vector for a pandemic than an impoverished population where the disease is going to run rampant and mutate and so on. Um, and there's even an estimated cost. These are figures that are a few years old. But the estimated cost of the pandemic, according to economists, would be significantly more than addressing global poverty now. So she asked, why are we not doing this? And that's the question that is motivating my talk today. And I'm going to show you another film clip. This will be the last. This is the um, film Outbreak. How many of you saw that from 1995? And the opening scene, which you're going to see, again, has all of the conventions of the outbreak narrative. So I'm going to start with that and then um, elaborate on it. And for some reason, it's going to be a little bit. So, here we go. Joshua Lederberg was the main organizer of the um, 1989 conference. And he's also the person, how many of you have heard of um, Richard Preston's The Hot Zone? Okay, I'll be talking about that. He actually asked, he, Richard Preston is a science writer who wrote a very sensationalized version of what happened at the um, 1989 conference, or of that message. And Lederberg asked him to write the book and scare people. So he, I mean, he actively did that. He did the same with Bioterror. Um, I can't remember the name of that book. Preston wrote a novel, but Hudson's not a novel. Hudson's about an Ebola outbreak in the US. That was among um, primates. So this opens with what's called a, an establishing shot, which is a very classic um, way that an outbreak, wow, this is really moving in my slow motion. Um, an outbreak narrative opens, um, and what it tells you is that this place is significant. There is something important about the specificity of this place, and of course, it's Africa. I think I'm going to skip it. Um, sorry. So what happens is um, the two guys you saw, Dustin, or Dustin, not Dustin Hoffman, sorry, um, Donald Sutherland and Morgan Freeman Jr. And they're in the kind of monstrous containment, biocontainment suits. And they go in and there's the Zaire doctor has called them in because these men have this horrific disease and he doesn't know what to do. And he says to them um, as they're walking out, uh, men 
um, at the beginning look like that and not last for 24 to 48 hours. There's one guy who says, tell my girl I love her, you know, who's his girl, whatever. So, you know, get a little sentiment in there. And, um, and then he says, but after that, they look like this. And he pulls the tarp up and the camera does a 180. And this is the shot we see. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but I just want to finish what you didn't see. Um, they go off and uh, Donald Sutherland says to Morgan Freeman, um, you know, get the plane, Billy. And he says, but shouldn't we? And he says, get the plane, Billy. This is worse than I thought. And the last scene is the helicopter um, moving overhead and everybody looking up expecting a drop of medicine. It is, in fact, a bomb and the entire camp blows up. So I will explain now why that's relevant um, to the outbreak narrative. It would have been a little more dramatic if you had seen it, but you can make your imagination. You know, Hitchcock said, right? Imagination can work on that. Um, so uh, it's so there. There are several really important features of the outbreak narrative. One of them is the geography of disease. And in the outbreak narrative, almost invariably, the threat moves from the global south to the global north. I can't think really of any example uh, from the 1990s into the last decade that um, that doesn't. So it moves from the global south to the global north. Expertise moves typically in the other direction. And this is an example to me, a really interesting image. I don't know if you can see that. It's the guy's face reflected in Donald Sutherland's visor. Um, it uh, is, to me, a very interesting image of expertise because the Zairean doctor right, takes him out, shows him this thing. We expect to confront this horrific spectacle. And instead, we see the, the image reflected in the visor of Donald Sutherland. So in effect, we see him seeing this image. And what I think the film is conveying to us is, you know, he's the expert. He knows what to do. He knows what he's looking at. We don't know. The Zairean doctor doesn't know. Donald Sutherland knows. Now, the film will com complicate that a little bit, but not all that much. It's just Dustin Hoffman will take over from Donald Sutherland because Donald Sutherland basically becomes a monster. Why? Well, he blew up the camp for the following reason. Two more features of the outbreak narrative, one of which is um, the idea of networks and interdependence, that this horrific thing that's you know, off in the jungle somewhere is very easily something that could now get out because we've, we're globalizing. It can get out and into the human web. And containment, that means we have to contain it and some people are just going to have to be expendable, right? So these guys in an African mercenary camp, even if they're Americans, right, they've in effect given up their citizenship by being there or some kind of entitlement, you know, he can blow them up. But when this thing in 1995, or whatever it is, the present day of the film, gets out, then it's a nor into a northern California town, and he wants the same solution. Everybody's up in arms. He says, well, these people are casualties of war, just as he said in 1967. And everyone says, but these are Americans. We can't do that to Americans. We can't do that to a North California town. So Donald Sutherland comes in, I'm sorry, Dustin Hoffman comes in and saves the day. Nonetheless, the expertise is still um, USAMRID, the army, the military version in the US of the CDC. Right? So expertise moving from um, north to south. OK, so those are the basics of the outbreak narrative. And what I want to do is just take you through the, some of the volumes that put the 1980, the 1989 conference produced two volumes. Emerging Viruses and Emerging Infections. Both of them came out in the early 90s, 92 and 93. And I'm going to be looking at some of the ways that the scientists and uh, medical professionals who participated in that were talking about um, the problem, what kind of vocabulary they were putting out, and how it got picked up by the mainstream media and popular fiction and film. So Richard Krauss, one of the editors and uh, editors of this volume, said, like science, emerging viruses know no country. There are no barriers to prevent their migration across international boundaries or around the 24 time zones. Richard Preston wrote a very sensationalized, I talked about that very sensationalized um, version of this in Hot Zone, which was a New Yorker piece in 1992 and came out as a book in 94 and just sensationalized. I mean, this really put this um, problem, Ebola, et cetera, into popular vocabulary. 
and he says, a hot virus in the rainforest lives within a 24-hour plane flight from every city on Earth. All of the Earth's cities are connected by a web of airline routes. The web is a network. Once a virus hits the net, it can shoot anywhere in a day. Paris, Tokyo, New York, LA, wherever planes fly. And by the way, the threat has to be somewhat apocalyptic. It has to be species threatening. If it's you know, some minor virus, it's not going to have this impact. So it's some horrible thing like Ebola. And the more horrible, the better. And then Lori Garrett, who is actually a very important and responsible journalist, wrote a book called The Coming Plague, which again was a bestseller. And this one was much more sedate than Richard Preston's. She was literally coming straight out of the 1989 um, conference. She hadn't attended, but she talked to all the people who had. And she was trying to tell the story that they were trying to tell. And she's a great example of what I'm talking about, because even though she's trying to do that, her language works against her and tells this more sensationalized story, even though she's trying to tell a more sedate story about development and the environment. And she writes, the Andromeda strain, does everyone know that reference from a Michael Crichton 1969 novel, 1971 film, and it was about microbes uh, that supposedly came from out of space and, you know, with a space probe and wiped out most of a town in um, the southwest of the U.S. Um, and it's all about how the scientists deal with that. The Andromeda strain nearly surfaced in Africa in the form of Ebola virus. Megacities were arising in the developing world, creating niches from which virtually anything might arise. Rainforests were being destroyed, forcing disease-carrying animals and insects into areas of human habitation and raising the very real possibility that lethal, mysterious microbes would, for the first time, infect humanity on a large scale and imperil the survival of the human race. And what's significant here, again, is how she's using her language. I can tell you the Andromeda strain, which gets used all the time in the science text, is always used for something from the global south. It would not be used for the hantavirus, which is equally de devastating, and which, in fact, there was an outbreak of shortly before all of this in the US Southwest, precisely the landscape of the actual Andromeda strain. It never gets used in that context, and the US does not have places from which virtually anything might arise. The other, the other interesting phrase here is mysterious microbes, right? They're new, we haven't encountered them before, but I want you to keep in mind, and you'll see it again in a moment why, keep in mind the use of the word mysterious here. So this has the effect of pathologizing certain spaces. This is part of the geography of disease, um, and it affects what we see and how we see it. My favorite, I have to say, I have a favorite of these conventions, human being versus the microbe. And it comes out all the time in the phrase microbial warfare. And people say, oh, well, that's just a metaphor. I want to look at that metaphor. So the, um, what happens is it is irresistible in the science literature not to animate the microbe, not to give it human um, traits and, and emotions. And Joshua Letterberg talks about the challenge of accommodating to the reality that nature is far from benign, at least it has no special sentiment for the welfare of the human versus other species. The survival of the human species is not a preordained evolutionary program. And what he says is humankind really doesn't like not being the favorite child of Mother Nature. We don't want to think of ourselves in evolutionary perspective and as vulnerable to something like a microbe. We would rather think of ourselves at war. We would rather think of that enemy as an enemy in very human terms, something that's actively out to get us. Krauss, microbes are not idle bystanders waiting for new opportunities offered by human mobility, ignorance, or neglect. They possess remarkable genetic versatility that enables them to develop new pathogenic vigor, escape population immunity by acquiring new antigens, and to develop antibiotic resistance. They are more than simple opportunists, they have also been great innovators. Okay, so that's from the science. Now let's look at what Preston does with that. Viruses are molecular sharks, a motive without a mind, compact, hard, logical, totally selfish. The virus is dedicated to making copies of itself, which it can do on occasion with radiant speed. The prime directive is to replicate. And this has the effect not only of affecting how we understand um, our dealings with the microbe, but also the other side of the equation, 
who and what gets pathologized, and with what consequences. So Barbara Cullerton, referring to another unwelcome immigrant, soul virus, a cousin of Asian Hantin virus, which causes hemorrhagic fever. Alan Kraut, historian, has a wonderful book, um, Strange Travelers? Silent Travelers, Silent Travelers, where he coins the term medicalized nativism. How people justify, and this goes back to my stranger point with Gerald Zimmel, how people justify their anxiety around immigrants. Now it is true that populations have different herd immunity. And it is true that when we encounter each other, obviously new diseases and germs are going to circulate. But that gets blown way out of proportion, and it really gets put exclusively on the immigrant, right? We all can think of experiences of that. Um, and this kind of language, I think, really reinforces, inadvertently, reinforces that way of thinking. Post 9-11, and it's whatever threat of the moment gets pulled in. Post 9-11, it's terrorists. Um, so Madeline Drexler refers to secret agents, microbes, as secret agents that shadow ecological change everywhere, nature's undercover operatives hijacking the cell's metabolic machinery, a wireless communication system called quorum sensing enables microbes to coordinate their activities. The next step, and this is why I asked you to think about the word mysterious, the next step once you animate the microbe is to make the microbe somehow almost a figures of science fiction, which is in fact where they're going. Um, and, and real, you know, kind of mysterious in some way. So Tom Geisberg, who is a researcher um, working on the uh, primate Ebola case that Preston's reporting on, talks about how when he looks into the uh, electron microscope, he sees white cobras, so he's looking at the Ebola. White cobras tangled among themselves like the hair of Medusa. They were the face of nature herself. The obscene goddess revealed naked. This life form thing was breathtakingly beautiful. As he stared at it, he found himself being pulled out of the human world into a world where moral boundaries blur and finally dissolve completely. He was lost in wonder and admiration, even though he knew that he was the prey. And the next step after microbial mystique is that the microbes become the voice of the earth incarnated. So the science, Carl Johnson, again writing in, the, um, in one of the two volumes coming out of the conference, talks about the Earth as a progressively immunocompromised ecosystem. And Preston talks about the Earth mounting an immune response against the human species, um, reacting to human behavior, and how the biosphere may not like the idea of five billion humans, or perhaps the human species is just so much meat that cannot defend itself against a life form that might want to consume it. The Earth's immune system, so to speak, has recognized the presence of the human species and is starting to kick in. And there are just tons of novels where this happens. One of them, and I, I keep wanting to write Chuck Hogan a fan letter. He just, every time I work on something, and now it's, now it's with genetics too, every time I work on something, this guy has written the novel that captures every convention that I've identified. And I think we're working along the same, um, the same uh, ideas, different media. Um, and the reason that I find it so important to work with popular culture is, besides enjoying it, um, is this. One of the things that happens that is so useful is a, a fic, you know, fiction or film will take a, a metaphor like microbial warfare and extend it into a full-blown dramatic scenario. And when it does that, you really get to see how these implications of this metaphor play out. So it's like amplifying the assumptions that are informing this um, supposed figure of speech. And in the case of Chuck Hogan, he writes about an environmentalist. Uh, there's a, there's a um, hemorrhagic virus that gets out, of course, in Africa. And it wipes out everybody. It's got a 100% kill rate. So Ebola has 90. It has a 100% kill rate, except this one environmentalist who gets called patient zero and then eventually zero. And what, he, what happens to him is he and the vi virus kind of merge. And increasingly, the virus takes over his body and seeds um, uh, outbreaks all over the United States. And the, the, uh, what happens in the novel is the CDC researchers have to try to capture him and contain this threat. Um, and this is the final part of the outbreak narrative, the scientist as hero expert. So it becomes almost a mythical encounter between, on the one hand, um, this virus speaking for the Earth 
And on the other hand, the scientists, epidemiologists, et cetera, medical researchers who are struggling to contain the threat, and they're contesting, the contest is over the fate of the human species. So whoever wins is going to either save or destroy the human species. Um, and here's the implication of that. The threat of a mutant virus gifted with human intellect and cunning posed hazards exceeding Merritt's worst imaginings. But all he envisioned was its one great advantage. Epidemic control had never been simpler. Zero was like a tumor Merritt could go in and surgically remove. Now remember where I started. I started by saying that what these guys were trying to do, both in Alma-Ata but also especially in the 1989 conference, was to say this problem is not just a problem for medical science. This is a problem we have to think of in broader geopolitical and socioeconomic terms. It's a problem about globalization and development. What do we get here? We're back to the medical solution. What they're saying is we can't wait for medical science to come in and save the day because these things are working faster than medical science. We may not be able to save the day. I don't know how many of you remember the early days of HIV when there was no cure and no treatment and everybody was saying, you know, this could be the end of the world. You know, that was, I was in New York in the early 1980s and that was the discourse at that time. And what these guys are saying, you know, we cannot wait around for science. What, these, what the language, what this narrative is enforcing is precisely that. Science will solve the day. Don't worry, we don't really have to change anything. So how does that look in, real, in the real world? Now I'm, I'm back to journalism. I'm back to the way that we talk about these things publicly in um, the mainstream media. This is from a May 2003 special issue of Newsweek on the SARS outbreak. And um, this is exactly what these two photos looked like while they were better cropped, but on um, effacing pages. With the caption below, which I printed above, um, basically um, linking them. So, fear of SARS prompts a Lufthansa crew to wear masks in the Hong Kong airport. The virus may have been born on a farm like the one above in Guangzhou, China, where animals and people live close together. And it elaborated in the body of the text, the novel coronavirus that causes the syndrome emerged from Guangdong, the same Chinese province that delivers new flu viruses to the world most years. Pigs, ducks, chickens, and people live cheek by jowl on the district's primitive farms, exchanging flu and cold germs so rapidly that a single pig can easily incubate human and avian viruses simultaneously. The dual infections can generate hybrids that escape antibodies aimed at the originals, setting off a whole new chain of human infection. The clincher is that these farms sit just a few miles from Guangzhou, a teeming city that mixes people, animals, and microbes from the countryside with travelers from around the world. You could hardly design a better system for turning small outbreaks into big ones. So the story being told is that the virus is moving, of course, from this south, global south, Farm. I don't think that's a farm, but that's what they're calling it, um, into right an airport through these guys and into the web. The um, article goes on to talk about how, don't worry, we have a human network that is amplifying these things and, and getting them out into the public and posing a threat, but we also have an information network. And that allowed scientists working, of course, in the global north, in the US and Western Europe, who were able with their superior technology to genotype. And I'm not, I'm not saying that this isn't somewhat true, right? There was a very important concerted effort to genotype SARS, and it was contained by this expertise. But of course, it was entirely moving in the other direction. So what is the story being told? Here's the outbreak narrative, right? Global south to global north is the threat. Uh, global north to global south, south is the direction of the expertise. It is a medical problem that requires the solution of scientific medicine, right? And this is exactly not the story that these guys were trying to tell. And the primitive farm, which it both temporalizes and spatializes the threat. It's as though these backwards people are living cheek by jowl with their animals because they don't know any better. Um, and they are living in such close proximity to a modern city that when we put the kind of old fashioned together with the modern, we get this explosion, right? So what story is not being told? Why are these people living cheek by jowl with their animals? It's not because they don't know better, it's because they're poor. Right? So in fact, this is a story of poverty. And poverty doesn't move from the global south to the global north. P 
Paul Farmer, is that a familiar name to people? He's a medical doctor and anthropologist who um, formed a, a group called Partners in Health, um, and they build state-of-the-art medical clinics in the most impoverished regions of the world and deliver state-of-the-art health care, or try to. Um, he's very successful, actually. And he started in the Kamsh in Haiti. That was where he did his field work as an anthropologist, and he built a state-of-the-art um, clinic there. And it's one of the most impoverished sections of the world. And he tells the following story about something called the Pelegre Dam. He said, well, you think these, that all this, all this stuff is coming from these people who are sick, they have um, abnormal numbers of HIV and multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and they're posing a threat and so on. He said, well, why did they get this way? Well, they were subsistence farmers that were doing quite well living along the banks of a river. What happened? Um, American corporate interests joined with the Haitian elite in Port-au-Prince and made the decision to put a dam in that was going to supposedly be good for Haiti and certainly was good for the American corporations that were behind this. And what happened? These people's land got flooded. They lost everything. They had to move to a much higher ground that wasn't arable. And lo and behold, they're impoverished. And lo and behold, they're sick. So he says, where did this problem really start? Did it really move from the global south to the global north? Or do we have to think about it in much bigger terms? And the narrative you're seeing here is the narrative of the outbreak narrative. It is not the narrative of the 1989 conference. So what can we do about it? Well, we can start by paying attention to the story that we're telling today about avian flu, right? Making the world a global village or a global barnyard, the not so great wall of China, Asia today, the perfect incubator. Um, that was Julie Gerberding, the head at the time of the CDC. Um, nature's bioterrorist, if you take a plane ride to Paris, you may be taking an epidemic along with you. The most menacing bioterrorist is Mother Nature herself, right? So according to one of, um, and I'm, I'm wrapping up, according to uh, Paul Farmer, diseases themselves make a preferential option for the poor. And according to someone who's very important to him, the Norwegian sociologist and peace activist, Johan Galtung, who coined the term structural violence um, in the early 1970s, uh, Galtung uses that term to refer to any disproportionate effects on population that vary with race, gender, income level, other variables, right? It is actual structural violence when we look at how diseases themselves make a preferential option for the poor. And what Farmer says is we need to think about that and work backwards and see why that's the case and understand it not as up the way things are, but as an active, agential, um, uh, not deliberate, but um, perpetuation of literally an act of violence. So what story do we want to tell? We can tell the very engaging story of scientists versus monstrous microbes doing battle for the fate of humanity, or human beings acknowledging social responsibility for the world in which we all live together. And what I would suggest is that the language of crisis and survival, which is the language of the outbreak narrative, which happens typically when the threat is immediate or, you know, whether it's in film or in real life or fiction or whatever, there's always this language of crisis and survival. And what does that generate? Of course it generates the solutions as quarantine, uh, vaccine production, and uh, drug production. Of course, if you're in the middle of an epidemic or a pandemic, those are going to be your major tools. But what if we thought not about crisis and survival, but how we want to live as citizens of a global world? What might we think of instead? Right? We might think about the Alma Ata solution. We might think about addressing global poverty as both a humanitarian and a pragmatic, as Margaret Chan has said, um, consideration. We can decide what story we want to tell, and it is both time and urgent. It is not just time, it is urgent. I will deliver my own language of urgency for us to change that story and to try to impact the world. Thank you.